Divine Truth Events. These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Faith and Prayer. Presented by Jesus on the 22nd of June, 2013, in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session three, part one. Yeah. Well, it's lovely to see you guys again. It's been all <laughs> lovely to see me, is it? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, we've had a very busy few, uh, well, has it been a month since we saw you last? Um, five, weeks. five weeks. Yeah. Yeah, we've had a very busy five weeks. Um, as you probably are aware, we had a New Zealand team of people here last time we met doing a heap of filming and they put a documentary or, a, or a, it was more like a news item um, on the New Zealand te television and, uh, and then for some and we also had the guy from the UK Sky News here last time and he put that on to English television and as a result of that we just got inundated <laughs> with a lot of different people uh, having requests for media interviews. So over the last uh, month we've done around 16 of them um, and uh, a lot of them overseas, most of the, well, in fact all of them have been overseas and, but it's been quite busy trying to organise it all and, and tee it up at the time zones and all those kind of things. And uh, it still hasn't finished actually, we've still got more to do and in fact there's now a documentary team coming from the UK uh, who will be here in August to do a um, week's worth of documentary so many uh, they probably want to interview some of you guys if you're willing to and um, they'll be here his name is Thomas Leader so he'll, he'll be here sometime in I think I've planned to do another seminar here in August the 10th uh, and the 11th and uh, he'll be here at that seminar there will also, we have also been approached by another TV station in the UK and, uh, and they're wanting to fly us to the UK to do their interview. So we may not be around for the next two weeks. Um, they want to do it pretty much straight away, so we'd be leaving not next week but early the week, the week after probably for two weeks if that happened, which means that we may have an opportunity to actually do a couple of seminars in the UK in the next month. Uh, as well so there's a whole heap of things to get ready for that as well <laughs> that we're trying to get ready now and um, and then of course we've had a lot of other people around the world we've done interviews in Africa as well in South Africa uh, as well as in Europe in Spain and in Iceland of all places um, so there's been all sorts of interest I don't know what's happening <laughs> um, I think I think the way it works is a lot of these media give uh, or their show to another play another media or license it to another media in another country and, and then they play it and then they play it and so forth so it seems to do the rounds and as a result we've got all of this stuff happening so that's probably why you haven't heard much of us <laughs> in the last five weeks because we've been a bit snowed under trying to manage all of that as well as still do our own thing and in addition to that we've been trying to get a lot of hardware stuff sorted out as well so it's been quite a busy five weeks or so for us and I feel it's probably going to be of quite a busy six months coming up. We also, um, the beauty of having the media pay for us to go to the UK is quite interesting because at the moment there's a lot of, quite a lot of people in the UK that have been interested in us coming but the, a lot of them are quite poor and they don't have the funds to, to pay for us to come. And so we were trying to work out how we'd get there. We don't have the funds to pay for us to go either. And as it was worked out, we might finish up having the media pay for us to go, which, which is quite, quite good. Um, we're, we're also looking at visiting the US in, uh, from October through to November as well. There's been a number of people there that have wanted us to come for some time. And so it looks like we'll be visiting three locations in the US as well in the next uh, in the latter half of the year so that's how, how our life's looking at the time at the moment hopefully your life isn't quite as busy 
uh, but, but just as enjoyable. <laughs> um, we've been planning to do a, a, also a lot of... We, we're trying, what we're trying to do in amongst all of that is to do a lot of frequently asked questions with Lena and Igor filming them. Because what we're finding is that we have people ask questions, like one question, and uh, quite often it's very, very difficult for the guys answering our email because they have to give the same answer over and they have to write it all out. Whereas, it, whereas it's great that if myself and Mary can just give an answer to a question and then it's posted on YouTube and then they just link to that answer and send the link back to the person. So we're still doing frequently asked questions as well. And they are quite uh, time consuming to do because every one of them has to be edited individually, generally. So it does take a bit of time. But I think we're up to around 210 or so that we've done so far on the FAQ channel. So if you haven't checked out the FAQ channel, it's worth checking out. There's a lot of really basic questions that we get asked. And in the future, what we want to do is come some quite complicated questions as well. We want to do quite a lot of questions about God, the universe and other questions that we're also asked. But we're slowly working our way through around a couple of thousand questions uh, that people have asked and we're trying to put them in the right sequence and orders and there's a little team of people working on that for us with Luli and Lena being the primary persons involved with that. And so that's been quite busy for them as well. So that's, uh, there's not much time to do much else for us at the moment. So that's what we've been focusing on. We've only just, as a result of that, got the last presentation we did here on prayer and faith onto the internet. We only, it's only, uh, sorry, it's, the sound has been loaded, but the video is yet to be loaded. Uh, the video will be loaded um, next week, I think. That'll probably be the case, won't it, Teresa? So, um, but what we wanted to do is take this opportunity to just thank every person who's involved in all of these things that are going on. There's a, there's a lot of documents getting typed up by different people. There's a lot of translating going on now. We have a new translation section on our website. And I think we have at the moment about 11, I think there's 15 total, isn't there? Co countries or different languages um, that we're starting to translate into, yeah. But I think I've only put about 11 up at this point. Um, and keeping up with my updates on the website is a bit difficult at times, but we should have the rest up over the next month or so. So there'll be 15 languages on the website, all with different downloads and ebooks and other things that they can download. So there's a whole team of people working on those in each country. And Barbara is basically doing all the administrative organising of, of all of that, which is, which is quite good. And then Barbara and her team hands over these books to Luli, and Luli then goes through and does them for e-books so that you can download them from websites and actually load them onto a personal a PDA of some kind, you know, whether it's iPad or uh, an iPhone or something like that, and read them on, on a book as well as for Kindle. So all of that's get happening behind the scenes as well now. And we're now, I think we have about, is it about 50, 50 books finished? And there's, 50 the and there's another 50 in the process right at the moment. Yeah, so that's quite a lot. In amongst all of that, um, I'm also trying to get a bit of time to write a book. Um, because I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to write a book uh, about the basics about divine truth. Just the very basics. We're going... Basically, it's like a presentation of the secrets of the universe, but, but from a very personal perspective, from the perspective of myself as I discovered these particular things. And it should be around about 60 to 100 pages, and Luli and Raj have put the pressure on me to do that. Um, and so, uh, so I'm trying to do that as well. I've, I'm only up to seven, page 7 at this point. <laughs> so... Um, Mind you, I've only been doing it for a week as well. So I get about, uh, I, get, I try to allocate about an hour a day to that and I usually get a page or two done during that hour. Would you like to hear the first seven pages? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll read that for you. Um, if I, I think I've brought a copy with me. And what we're hoping to do with this book is actually give it away, all right, around the world and even 
uh, somehow negotiate with some publishers that they're willing to do it somehow at cost or something like that and that they uh, give it away on their websites and do it by donation just like we've been doing it so that's what we're trying to do Raj is trying to follow up you know what publishers might uh, do things by donation rather than doing it the normal ways that they currently do it and there are some publishers who are interested in doing that at this point so so it should be interesting to see what happens with the book and um, what happened with the book is that um, there's been a team of people and Raj, Raj and Luli in particular have gotten together a whole heap of information from a lot of different presentations that have been done and then they've basically tried to summarise all that information into a book form of around 50 pages or so, wasn't it? Um, and, and so what I've done is I've sort of used that as a basis, uh, as sort of notes, if you like, of, of this, but um, it's quite different to what the guys put together. But, uh, but that's what, there's been all this research that's been done, is what I'm pointing out by Raj and, Su, uh, Raj and, and Luli. Uh, to get all of this material together. And that helps me a lot when I'm writing my book, basically. It means that I don't have to do, put all the stuff together. Uh, somebody else has already done that, and it means that I can just write it from my own perspective. So there's a lot of help that I've received to write this so far. So here it goes. This is the introduction. Since God is the creator of the universe and the creator of the laws that govern all the things seen and unseen... Only God knows all the truth in the universe. Divine truth is God's absolute truth. As such, God's truth is infinite, logical, scientifically accurate, and the true reality of universal life. Humankind has over tens of thousands of years hungered and searched for absolute truth on a large variety of subjects. Usually this search has been through a process of experimentation scientific or otherwise, with limited results. Since humans are not God and no one knew how to receive these truths from God, humankind has continued the process of experimentation in order to discover new truth. In the first century, I discovered the way to receive truth from the source of all truth, the Creator. This way was created by God and only needed someone to discover it through the exercise of their own will. I am Jesus of Nazareth. The way I discovered included experimentation, but also involved the essential ingredient of developing a direct relationship with God. Rather than sharing all the truth I discover with others, I focus on showing others the way in which they can also receive truth from God directly. My first century wife, Mary Magdalene, and I have come to earth for the second time, along with another 12 people. I was named Alan John Miller by my parents in this life, and Mary has been named Mary Suzanne Luck. We have returned for many reasons, which include sharing the truths that we have learnt from God during our 2,000 years of existence on earth and in the spirit world. More importantly, we wish to share the method or way that God created, whereby humans can learn God's truth and receive God's love. The teachings in this book are a collection of material that we have presented to and discussed with others for over 2,000 years. These teachings describe the way that we can infinitely grow in all of the qualities that God has, such as love, truth, happiness, wisdom and power, and the way in which we can remove from ourselves any quality that God does not have, such as sadness, fear, unhappiness, pain and suffering. Our personal infinite growth in God's qualities and infinite growth in the development of our own soul, our individuality and pers personality and character, is only possible by engaging this way to God. Absolute truth is all-encompassing. It describes the nature of the physical, spiritual and soul-based universes and dimensions, the structure of these universes, and the loving laws that govern them. It also describes the nature of the human, the physical body, the spiritual form, and the completed soul, and how the human soul operates and controls the physical and spiritual forms, along with every aspect surrounding the development and progression of the human soul and how it interacts with its environment. It describes the created state of the soul and also the full potential of future states 
and how the human soul can grow infinitely and become completed in love. It demonstrates how the human can become at one with God in love, a state where all of our feelings and beliefs surrounding love will automatically be in harmony with God's love, where we will automatically act in harmony with God's love without needing to try, and where we will only ever experience joyful and pleasurable emotions, just as God does. Following God's way will affect every area of your life, just as it has impacted upon every area of my own life. It will involve a growing, ever-changing, loving personal relationship with God, with yourself, with your soulmate, your children, with your friends and acquaintances, with people who have passed into other dimensions, with your environment, with the universe, and even with those whom you now see as your enemies. It will demonstrate to you that if you receive God's love, everything else will be added to you. I can assure the reader that everything I've written about in this book is true. I'm not making up stories, presenting theories as facts, nor am I just hoping that what I'm teaching is true. Rather, all of the things I present here I have discovered through my own personal experience. And I suggest to you that no matter who you are, you can do the same. God's truth can only be fully understood through a personal experience between oneself and God, which will be emotional and life-changing. It cannot be fully understood with the intellect, since intellectual development has limitations, whereas emotional experience has no limit. This book is a means to provide an overview of God's truth, but a personal relationship with God will be necessary and essential in order for the material in this book to be truly comprehended. In addition, it is essential that the reader does not assume that this book, or any other book for that matter, can describe all of God's truth. This book is an introduction to the infinite truth that is available for each of us to receive from God about ourselves and every subject within the universe, should we choose to engage a personal relationship with our Creator. God's truth is infinite in nature, and although simple to obtain, is complex in its implementation. So humankind will continue to discover more of it throughout eternity without ever knowing divine truth in its entirety. Only God will ever know all of God's truth. God, of, God is divine and absolute truth is divine truth. So that's the introduction. I won't read much more now because I think it will bore you maybe. <laughs> but then I go on to discussing God and my personal experience with God and so forth. And, and we go through many of the other things about um, the human soul and what happens to the human soul and so forth. So hopefully it will give people a good understanding and grasp of the principles of divine truth from an intellectual perspective. And it will be a great first book to read. That's what our goal is, to actually make it an engaging and quite powerful first book to read emotionally. So when I discuss issues about God, for example, you, I'll read you a bit of that as we go through our seminar over this weekend. And, uh, and you can tell me and give me some feedback. That will be good as well. Is there any comments you'd like to make about it? <laughs> Barbara, you'd like to? Who's, who's got our mics today? Thank you. And thank you. Only when you were reading that out, I was I was getting visions of um, laying back in a in an armchair with children around and reading that book to them. Yeah. Um, as instead of nighttime storybooks, that would be the book in the home to read in the future. And I thought it was very beautiful. Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that it will be quite a personal book as well. Um, you know, I've started it out being quite personal, as 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 you'll find in the section about God. And the reason why I would like that is because I want sort of to take people on the journey of the discovery of the truths that I've been presenting to you. The problem with these presentations um, and any seminar that I give is that I can't really take you on the journey. Um, the only thing I can do is present a whole series of truths to you and then you decide whether or not you want to go on the journey or not. With, with God, right? And that, that's... So what I'm trying to achieve with the book is try to help people go on this journey with me so that I can describe the journey and, and people can come to see 
what kind of journey they will probably need to engage if they're really, truly going to have a relationship with God. The reason why I raise that, actually, is because there are some fundamental questions that each of us must face with regard to our relationship with God. And yet many of us ignore these fundamental questions. So, so to give you an example, does God exist? That's a fundamental question. It's pointless trying to have a relationship with a God that doesn't exist. If there is no God that exists, then why try to have a relationship with God? It would be just like a figment of our imagination. So one of the very first things that we should determine in our progression is whether God exists or not. Does that make sense? And, and my feelings are, if we haven't personally done that yet, you can't hope to receive divine love without doing it. So we need to start at that place. And then the second place I would look at is what are God's qualities? What are God's fundamental attributes and qualities? Like, who wants to connect to a God who's like the Bible God? You know, the one who's going to come and destroy all the wicked and you don't really know whether you're wicked or righteous <laughs> because sometimes the rules seem to change for each person. Um, and and do, is that the kind of God you want to connect to? So for a lot of people, this is why they don't have a really good relationship with God is because they do believe in a God that has qualities that are very human. In, in other words, they believe in a God that, that you know, has anger and rage and wrath and desire for punishment and resentment. These are all things the Bible does say God is, but is God really like that? All right. Now, unless you have a way of determining whether God is like that, it's highly unlikely you'll have a relationship with God. And so this is one of the things that I've described in the book of how I went through the process of having these, this awareness come to me through the experience rather than just talking about God's qualities and not addressing the emotional reasons why we can't accept these particular qualities as God's qualities. And this really brings me to the topic I wanted to discuss with you today. The topic uh, is still this topic of prayer and faith, right? Uh, so this is now uh, still part of the Relationship with God series. And we're still talking about faith and prayer. There's so much that last time I didn't get to speak about. So this, you could say this one is session three. And uh, I doubt whether I'll cover all of it today either, so we're probably going to have a session four about it tomorrow. Now that, so that's the topic we're uh, raising again. And we, last time we got together, and many of you were here last time, remember last time we got together we discussed this issue of faith and what faith really was. Now, can you remember some of the main points that we gave about faith last time we got together? Do you want to just, if you want to make some comments? And don't be, a lot of you are getting quite shut down by spirits with regard to your questioning. So just, just put up your hand if you got, if, you, if something comes to your mind, just put up your hand and we'll go from there. Ange, thanks, and then come down. Uh, for it to be faith, it needs to be a fact. It needs to be the truth, God's truth. So it has to be based on facts. Do you remember that point? Now, can you see why that's such an important point? You know, what's the point in having a faith in something that's wrong? <laughs> you, you, at the end of the day, you'll spend years and years and years and years trying to discover it, and because it's wrong or not a fact, you'll never discover it, of course. Right? And then what you do you do? Well, then you'd say, then that's when we came up with things like blind faith. Now, I suggest blind, there's no, nothing blind about faith. Nothing blind about it at all. If we come down. It's based on past experience. Okay, so it's also based on past experience. Truthful experiences that we've had in the past. In other words, we, it, it builds as well, doesn't it? Like, so, so, for example, remember I brought up the issue of flight and remember we talked about the different people who have been involved in the 
in the process of flight over the many hundreds of, and in fact, few thousands of years of human history that's been documented. And there has been a documented series of events that have occurred during that period of time that talk about flight and, and the different things that they've discovered of flight. And each subsequent thing built on a previous one because the experiences and the discoveries of the previous group of people led to the next group of discoveries. And as a result, even in this, cent in this century just gone, the, the 20th century, even in that century, we went from having complete uncontrolled flight for just a few moments, a few seconds, right the way to so controlled flight that 800 people can travel 15,000 kilometres safely, right? in that period of time, because each thing built on the previous thing. So built on the past experience. Yep. If we come down to Joy and then across on this side, if we go up, starting, yep. Um, to grow faith requires experimentation, which kind of implies the willingness to not always be right. Okay, so we can't expect to be right all the time, so we've got to, exper we've got to be able to experiment. Now, the problem with many religions on the planet is they have a very, very set group of laws and principles and, and that restrict what you would call experimentation. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to experiment with things that are obviously immoral or unethical. But we do need to have some kind of experiment in order to discover new truth. This is how a scientist would work, yes? Yep. If we come across to Al... Um, along that lines, it's something that we have to develop within ourselves. Right, so it's a personal emotional experience, isn't it? So yeah. it's got to be a personal and it's going to be emotional as well. It can't be just something that just you think about, but it does involve your thoughts because obviously it's also logical. If it's factual, it's also logical, but it also has to be a personal emotional experience. And, and would that be part of the longing by when you develop that? Yes, well, this is something I would like to talk about today in terms of how our faith grows, how our faith continues to grow over periods of time. And, and of course, the longing for truth and the longing for love will help our faith grow in, uh, in both of those longings. Yep. If we go back to... Um, faith is not inside our soul. It has to be developed. And a quality that is developed... All right, so it's not, it's not a given. Yeah. Not, it's not a given. It's not something that God just put in there and, and everything's fine. It's something that you've got to grow. And it has the characteristic of being able to grow infinitely. So you can get to the point where you have an infinite amount of faith. Well, that, that's the point where God, obviously, is, that's God's domain. And we can grow and grow and grow in faith as we go through. And... It turns from faith, in fact, at some point in our growth, into a certainty. It's something that's completely factual and certain. Something that we know that we no longer need faith to believe in anymore because we know for certain through our own personal experience that it's a fact. That's, that's where faith will lead us to that point. Yep. So if we still start, uh, yep, and then come down the same. The experimentation. Um, is risky. It, it has risk involved. Um, There's in risks. It. Yep. What risks? You, you think about the guys who are experimenting with flight. What was the risk there? <laughs> Death <laughs> was the risk. Right? So this is the thing with experiment. That there are ways to circumvent, uh, you know, the risks to a degree. But you can't, with any experiment, expect there to be no risk, can you? Because it, for all of the discoveries of humankind, and particularly the discoveries that we've made in this 20th century just gone, most of them involve risk of some kind. So you can't sort of expect everything to be risk-free. Now, many of us want it to be risk-free, don't we? Have you found that with your life? You sit there at home watching telly, playing some video games, whatever, and then, uh, you know, you think about going out into the world and then you go, no, I think it's safer to sit home here <laughs> doing my thing. And we have a real strong aversion to the potential of our life being damaged further than what it is. 
And so often that causes to have a very, very large fear of taking risks, does it not? And many of us are still in that place, actually, of taking risk when it comes to developing our nature and character. For, for, for example, many of you, I still notice, have a lot of problem with taking the risk of being truthful, for example. Right? There's still this desire in you, maybe I need to just falsify it a bit and that way I'll protect something and not understanding some things as we'll go through uh, in this discussion today. Okay, anything else that, uh, Sandra, if we come down? I can't shake this um, thing that we've talked about somewhere along the line in the past about um, that faith is something um, not yet seen but hoped for. Is that the beginnings of faith when you just experiment and you don't know yet, but you're yeah, willing to... You could say, in fact, and we didn't discuss this in our last presentation, but you could say that hope is like the imagining of faith. It's like, and we've got to be very careful with hope, though, because many people hope for things that are not true. <laughs> many of you hope for things that are not true in your day-to-day -day life, actually. And uh, I used to do that quite frequently with my interactions with other people. With, uh, with my interactions with other people, I used to always hope that they'd treat me well. And, of course, when you didn't get treated well under those circumstances, what did you experience? some pain and suffering, whereas it, once you give up that hope, because it's actually a futile hope, <laughs> then uh, you know for certain what, how you're going to be treated through the experience of the individual. So when I know a person and I can feel their emotions, now I know how I'm going to get treated. Sometimes they'll treat me well, and under other circumstances they'll treat me badly, and I know what circumstances they'll treat me badly, and I know what circumstances under which they'll treat me well. Now that, that is faith rather than just hope. Hope, remember, is not necessarily based on fact, whereas faith is. Huh? Okay. Anything, anyone else? Yeah, if you can make, and then down to... Um, sometimes um, faith is like an act of a will, like um, to either choose to have faith in something or be overcome by darkness like it's like a sometimes I have to choose it or hold on to the faith in the early stages okay yep I agree faith is something that you need to hold on to but but you always have a good reason to don't you because in the end it is based on fact <laughs> you know so there's not like there's bad reasons to hang, hold on to things there's good reasons to hold on to things when they're based on fact but it's pretty pointless having faith in something that's not a fact so it's no good holding on to things that are not facts, is it? You think about it, the, in the world today, the majority of us and, uh, continue to hold on to things that are not facts. Right? And then we put our faith in them, we put our hope in them, and of course we're going to get disappointed because it's not a fact. Sooner or later, it's only the facts that are worth having faith in. Right? And what I'm saying is that God existence is a fact and all these other things that I'm presenting are facts but they're only facts that I've established for myself because many of you have yet to establish them for yourself right and the trouble with someone getting up here and saying to you I've established this fact and that fact and this fact and that fact and this fact it might all sound very good but at the end of the day it's not going to change your life until you establish those facts for yourself can you see and this is where it's a very personal experience. This is why it's pointless listening to somebody speak without taking some action and attempting to try the experiments. Without experimentation, in the end, you're going to end up with the same result as anybody else. And that is, you'll have heard a whole heap of things that you don't know whether are true or not. Right? And what we want to do is make sure that we get beyond that point into the area of certainty. Um, and I think I have put a T there. Where everything is certain. It's only when everything is certain that you actually have a tendency to relax. Have you noticed that? Right. So you imagine if you knew more and more things about the universe as certainties, can you see that you would also become more and more relaxed? 
in the way in which you lived your life, the way in which you trusted how everything is going to work, everything would come quite clear to you in that place. Can you see that? But, but if everything's not certain, then of course you've got to go through a process of experimentation and as we've said, the experiment involves a risk and the risk, one of the risks are that you'll be disappointed. That's one of the risks. And yet our willingness to be disappointed is a part of faith. Our willingness to actually go through a process of experimenting only to find out in the end that it was all wrong. Now, what's happened for many of us is that we've done that in the past. We've experimented with one thing and we've experimented with another sometimes. And in, in particular with religion, we've ex often experimented with one type of concept and then experimented with another, only to be disappointed at different times. And then after a while, we become disillusioned. We become cynical. And I don't know about you, but one thing I notice in the human race is a lot of cynicism. Yeah. And we become even worse, I feel, is we become cynical about love. We don't believe love actually works. We don't believe that love actually has the power that it has. We become so cynical, in fact, that we close ourselves down to love. And that's something that I'd like to talk with you about with regard to faith during our discussion today. Is there anything else that you can recall about our discussion? If we come across, die, if we go to straight to die first and then cross. And then on this side it was joy. So if we come down to joy. Um, that the development of faith has the potential to lead us into joy? Yeah, well the development of faith actually causes us to act in a lot, causes action, doesn't it? Um, and it, therefore it's going to result in a lot of things besides just joy. Joy is one of the qualities that result from it, but there are many other things that are going to result from it too. Because once we act and then we experience the joy of having some certainty, um, because we've come to, we've gone, we've moved from I, uh, having faith in the concept to knowing for certain about the concept, once we do that, you experience the joy of knowing for certain. If you imagine what it must have been like for the Wright brothers when they flew the very first time. And I think it only lasted for a few seconds. I can't remember exactly how many seconds, but I think it was about 18, 20 seconds where they had a controlled flight. And then uh, a few months after that, they had, their, they had a six-minute controlled flight. You imagine how elated they would have been after that. Uh, you imagine them just jumping around, although from what I've read about both of the men, I haven't met them personally. Um, maybe they didn't jump around all that much, because <laughs> I know they were quite sedate people. But th th there was this feeling in them that pulled them. And, and obviously, you imagine the joy of actually having it happen after you've just imagined it happening, having faith that it happened, and looking at all the laws involved. And they, they had to find a lot of laws of aerodynamics for it to happen. There, there's all the laws of controlled flight, which are all the laws involved with aerodynamics. They had to discover every one of them and apply them. Even if somebody else discovered them, they had to put them into application. And as a result, they finished up with these, with these flights. Now, of course, I'm not saying that they were the very first people who ever flew, because... Um, Historically, there's a quite argumentative facts about they, who was, in fact, the very first person who flew. But they learned how to have controlled flight. Right? So it's not just sort of jumping out of a window and hoping for the best. Um, they could control their flight through understanding the properties of flight. And this is what faith draws us into doing. Take, we take actions, building upon the laws and the past experiences... We experiment, but our experiments are not useless. They're not just based on imagination. They're based on the truth of past experience. Right? So it's not a silly process. It's a very, very scientific process, actually, developing faith. And in fact, without faith, no scientific development would have ever been discovered on this planet. We would have made no scientific progress on this planet without somebody having some faith. 
somebody having some imagination and then doing some experiments and working through the issues of experimentation. Right. For, for the, if you look at the, a lot of our development over the last, in terms of scientific development over the last 100 years or so, a lot of it has come through the experimentation of the electronics side of things, has, hasn't it? A lot of our growth has occurred through this experimentation. And electronics involves the natural laws that man discovered. We still don't know what causes electricity to flow, really. We still don't really understand it. We have a lot of theories that seem to be proven as fact. right? And we've measured the results of it. And in fact, all of us base our entire life on it now. And most of us are willing to trust our life with it now. Whereas 100 years ago, that wasn't the case at all. And yet, we still don't really know the underlying reasons why there is this seeming flow of electrical energy and how the flow actually occurs. Does that make sense? Nobody really understands it at the, at, at the subatomic level as to what's really going on. However, we have a lot of theories. Lots and lots of theories, in fact. But we have measured the actual action, the results. So we know for certain that something is happening because we use it every single day. Right. And it's almost now, for many of you, just as natural to pick out your mobile phone and talk to somebody on the other side of the world as it is for you to jump in the air. Right? And I suggest many of you probably pick out your mobile phone more than you jump <laughs> in the air in the course of a day. And, uh, and that's because it is so, such a natural thing for us to do. We, we understand not so much... We don't understand so well the laws involved, but we understand them enough to use them. And that's a growing thing with regard to our faith in the electronic side of things. So faith has all of those kind of qualities. And we had some more that we wanted to add. There was... Yep. Well, you've, you've really just answered what I was going to say because I was going to say that faith needs to be based upon law, upon God's law, and, yep. and we need to experiment based on God's law. Yeah. So we could call the facts. There's not just the physical facts, but there is also the structure that governs the physical facts. And this is a very important area of investigation, I feel, for humanity. It's something I've been fascinated in for 2,000 years, is this investigation of the structure that governs the facts. And uh, that's what I call law, or God's laws. And to me, that is a more fascinating process of discovering laws than it is even discovering what the facts or the results of the laws are. So... It's a very, it's a very fascinating area of of investigation. Joy, you had, you were going to say, there was someone else over there, no? What this, one of the things this discussion taught me was that God wants me to be the scientist. God wants me to investigate. God wants me to be curious, mm -hmm. and also that if I don't have that personal growth through, and I'm not willing to do the experimentation and have the personal emotional experience. I won't ever get to certainty. No, I, even if everybody else around you gets to certainty, yeah. you still won't be at certainty, yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Although it's interesting with faith, and that is if one person has faith in some area, generally what finishes up happening is they finish up influencing all the people in that area. So if you think of uh, 150 years ago, how many people thought it was possible to get to the moon? Well... Quite a lot of them thought it was possible, perhaps, but the majority of people on the planet laughed and scoffed at the idea. Huh? And the same applies to flight. The majority of people on the planet laughed and scoffed at the idea controlled, of controlled flight. However, now, 150 years later, what do we find? We find that we don't laugh at those co uh, concepts at all. In fact, all of us see how simple it seems to be to get there. When we say simple, obviously there's a lot involved, but there's a, it, it, man has done it, and therefore we know it to be a fact. And I feel this is also one thing we need to bear in mind, is that it just requires one person on this planet to have faith in something, 
and then eventually work through their faith to the point where, they, where through their experience it becomes a certainty in order for every person on this planet to be affected by that choice. And that's how a single person can change the world. Just like that. It's only through acting upon their faith. So you can see it's a very powerful quality, right? It's a very powerful quality and it is not religious in its nature. Although it can have connotations for our investigation of God, it is actually something, faith is something that we engage all the time, every single day. We engage faith. Now, some of us do it more than others. Some of us take higher risks than others. But we still engage our faith every single day. But often we don't call it that. Right? We call it something else. But faith is the right term for it. No more. Anne, do you want to go? And then across to die. I've just checked my notes. Yep. Um, faith is not ephemeral. It's constant no matter the circumstances. Sorry, faith is not a... It's not ephemeral, it's, it's not transitory, it's constant, no matter the circumstances. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If it's real faith, we have a feeling that we never let go of. We hold on to it all the time. We never let go on, of it. Obviously, that's very different than, than lacking humility. You see, if we lack humility, then we're not allowing ourselves to change. And faith does allow change. Right? Because it is an experimental process, it's going to allow change. But it doesn't mean that we just throw away things all of a sudden unless they are false. Of course, when they're false, we do throw them away. When we have proven them to be false. Not because everybody else is laughing at it, but because we've proven it to be false. Right? So, as you know, quite often Mary and I get laughed at quite a lot, right? Right? And even uh, when we're interviewed by people in the media and the public, we often get laughed at quite a lot. And I find it quite interesting, uh, in a way, that people do that. Because it's not very logical to laugh at somebody that you haven't proven to be false. And this, and I feel also it's not very loving to laugh at anybody under any circumstance. But that's a separate decision. But if it comes to logic... It's not logical to laugh at people who you believe are wrong unless you've proven it to be wrong. And even then, you've got to consider, is it loving to laugh at them? Surely you would rather have compassion for them, wouldn't you, if you loved them? And this is what we find frequently, is that most of the people on this planet, and even yourselves, have at different times, if you think about your past, would have held on to the concept that what the general public believes in is true and anything that's outside of that scope must be laughed at or ridiculed. And many of us have laughed at all sorts of things, if you think about it, only to find out later on that it was true. <laughs> right? and, and this is what we've got to be very careful of because faith would prevent us from doing such a thing. If we truly had faith, we would know what we don't know. <laughs> and if you know what you don't know, then you don't laugh at people who haven't proven it either way and who have a different idea or concept than you do. Right? So it's very important to understand how faith would actually affect a lot of your life in the long run. Now... So that was our discussion. We, we discussed faith and then we discussed last time we got together a little bit about prayer. But I would like to leave my discussion about prayer a bit longer because I want to focus on some things about faith that, uh, that many of you may not be aware of how it's influencing your life already in negative and positive directions. Shall we do that first? So let's do that. Now, in the past uh, few years in particular, I've talked to you about, uh, I would say, six or so primary qualities. If you analysed all the things that you've seen, particularly if you've listened to my presentations for a long time, 
What are the primary qualities that keep on popping up in pretty much every discussion that we have? So, humility is one of them. So let's write these down. Humility. Steadfastness. Steadfastness. Yeah. Um, it's probably not one of the primary things that I've discussed, I don't think. But if we go to, right, up to Rachel. Sincerity. Yes, but there's some bigger qualities than that, even. If we go behind you to Elizabeth. Love and truth. So, so truth. Love. If we come down to Teresa. Ethics and morality. Ethics and morality, yes, which are all part of love, really, and truth, I feel. Yep, if we go out to back, uh, if we go f first, yep. Uh, passion and desire. Passion and desire, yes, but there are bigger ones than that that I've discussed with you. Uh, okay, if we come down um, the front here to Lorleen and then across here to Luli. Let's do Luli first, you got the mic. Courage. Courage, yes, but... It's one of those... Uh, free will. Will. Free will, or your will. Very, very important thing. Many of you are missing out on exercising your will, even though you don't realise it. One more quality that is a primary quality in your future. What's that, Raj? Honesty. Oh, that's in truth, I think. Yeah. If we come, if we go back, uh, yep. Faith. Faith. <laughs> the one we're discussing. <laughs> All right. It's interesting, though, that you've listed uh, a lot of what I would call positive qualities. In fact, they're the five, five most important things for you to develop those five things that I've now just listed on the board. All other things that you develop will come as a result of developing those particular things, in fact. But there's one thing that is not on the board that I've discussed with you very frequently. Any idea what that is? So if you come across to here, and then up back to... Repentance. Um, yes, I have discussed repentance, but that's one of the laws of love. So, that's, yep. Prayer. Prayer, I have discussed prayer. So prayer is an operation, isn't it? So these are all qualities, but prayer is an operation. So what I'm going to do is put prayer right there. And there's one other thing. One other thing that's very important to the rest of your existence. But... But it's not a positive thing. What is it? Self-reliance. Well, yeah, where does self-reliance come from, though? This, is the this quality is why we become self-reliant. Lack of um, depending on God. It is a lack of depending on God, but why would we choose to do that? Fear. Right? But it's not good to yell it out. <laughs> Let's write it here. Now I'm going to write it in large letters because at the moment for the majority of us, it's the largest thing in our life. Still. All right? Okay, now let's... These are the qualities that I've discussed with you the most. All right? In the, in the last five or six years that you've heard our recorded discussions, these are the qualities that I've discussed the most with you. They appear in almost every talk that we've ever given. There are these qualities in each of them, all of them at the same time appear most, in most talks we've ever given. Now, what I would like to discuss with you is this problem with fear. Right? And how it affects your faith. And how it affects the choices and the decisions you make in your life. That's what I would like to discuss with you. 
Because for most people, they don't have a faith in the truth. They actually have a faith in their fear. And most people don't use their will in harmony with love and truth. They use their will in harmony with fear. And most people don't know how to love because most of the time they are afraid. And most people don't tell the truth or even want to know the truth because most of the time if you hear it or you are afraid. And most people don't want to cry and most people don't want to acknowledge where they're at at any one point in time because most of the time they are afraid. <laughs> this is a problem, don't you think? All right. It's a big problem. Now, how can you ever develop these qualities when fear is your primary motivator. And I suggest to you that for the majority of you, fear is still your primary motivator. And you're not willing to confront the truth about fear. In other words, you have no faith that fear is not real. You see, you feel the fear in your body and you feel the fear as a, 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 in terms of your, in your heart and your, and your emotions. And as a result of feeling it, you believe it is real. But there are people in the universe who know one fact, and that is, for them, fear does not exist. And in fact, every single person who becomes at one with God no longer is afraid of anything. Now, why is that so significant? Well, let's just for a moment do a little side shift. In the 2010, I think it was, and in 2009, I gave a series of talks about fear. I think one of them was called... Well, I think the very first one was, feel the f it was fear is your friend. How many of you think fear is your friend right now? <laughs> Still no one. That was the truth that I presented in 2008. So we're talking now, it's 2013. And in 2008, I think it was, I presented the fact that fear is your friend and not your enemy. And still none of you believe it. Now, why is that? Because you're afraid. <laughs> yeah, good answer. And then in 2009, I gave a series of talks, and one of the talks was Fear Revisited. Like, Bride said revisited, but Fear Revisited. <laughs> and of course, uh, that talk is uh, mentioned quite a lot by the media because I, I, I showed some videos. Uh, just trying to help you confront your fears in different areas. And of course, they then thought that I was trying to show you videos to make you frightened of 2012. But in 2009, that was, we gave those series of talks about fear. Why do you think that some of the very first talks I ever gave on this planet after, when I've returned were about fear? Because fear has a huge effect on your life. Much greater effect on your life right now than the majority of you are even aware. Do you know that many of you don't put up your hand even in a seminar because of fear? And it's the same fear that's been there since the very first seminar you came to, for many of you. That fear is just one fear that hasn't changed for many of you. And of course, do you know what comes along? Spirits and other people come along and manipulate that fear. They change your behavior through your fear. Your fear is, in fact, you have no other enemy other than fear. And it's not even an enemy, it's a friend. <laughs> right? So, so this is a problem we have. 
is we still see fear as our enemy and we don't see that it's our only problem. It's our only problem with regard to developing these particular qualities. And what I'd like to do is illustrate to you how that's the case and how that relates to faith. Most of you have faith in your fear. And in fact, your faith in your fear is greater than your faith in anything else. Because as soon as your fear is triggered, you forget the truth. You forget love. You forget humility. You forget your will. And you give all of those things away. You give away your will. You give away love. You don't, you don't trust it anymore. You give away the truth. You don't tell the truth anymore. Right? You forget these things. You give away humility. You don't let yourself feel what you're really feeling in that moment because you're terrified. And in that moment, faith is not guiding you. Or we could properly say, faith in the error is guiding you. Right? Now, fear is all about error. And when I say error, I'm now talking about the things that are not true in the universe. Remember we said that faith was based on things that are facts. Error is based on things that are ideas, concepts, imaginings, and so forth, that, and none of them are facts, but you think they are facts. Remember when we first gave the very first talk about fear in 2008, I talked about fear and this concept, and many others have said it before me, and that is that fear is false expectations appearing real. So it's error, or things that are false, appearing real. Real. You believe they're real even though they're not. Isn't that having a faith in error? Believing something is real even though it's not real. Now, many of you criticize other people for doing this. So I've noticed that if a, if a person who's Christian discusses their Christian beliefs with you, many of you defend what you believe. But also you go on this sort of attack of their false belief. So if their false belief happens to be the death, the belief in my blood as a, as a sacrifice for their sins, you then attack that false belief. But really all they're doing is the same thing you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis with your own life. You are believing in things that are false that you think are true. And that dictates a lot of the choices that you make too, just like it dictates a lot of the choices the Christian makes with regard to that belief that they have. So we've got to be careful that we're not hypocritical, right? That we, that we, we st start to see the real problem. And the real problem is that whenever we believe in things that are false, we have no hope for our future. Whenever we have faith in the errors, we have no hope for our future, really, even if you believe you do. Now, you remember in the very first presentation I gave publicly, um, obviously I gave a lot of five years of presentations privately before this time, but in 2008, remember some of you were even present there. Who was present at the very first talk in 2008 at Perda High Bloom's um, shed. A few of you? Yeah. So that very first talk was called The Secrets of the Universe. Right? And in that very first talk, I presented some concepts and ideas that I know as fact. But of course, nobody else knows them as fact on this planet unless they've experienced them. And there's only been 13 other people other than me on the planet who has experienced them. But, but I presented them as fact at the time. In that presentation, I discussed with you the concept of soulmates. Do you remember that? 
You remember how I discussed how the soul splits in two? And many of you have seen these kind of presentations since, how the soul splits in two. One half of the soul connects with two bodies, the spirit and physical body. The other half of the soul connects with the two bodies, the physical and spirit body. Remember, I've discussed this with you many, many times, right? Many times, so, so much so that most of you know it down pat. Isn't that the case? You can ream it off the top of your head, re relating it to somebody else. How many of you have experienced it? Yeah, not many. Do you know why? Because you're afraid of it. And you believe in something else. That's why you haven't experienced it. Now that's something I presented as a fact again, five years ago. And yet here in 2013, five years, and it's actually now five and a half years later, the majority of you have yet to even experience it. It's still not a fact for you. And in fact, the majority of you have no faith in it, actually, at all, in fact. Can you see how you've been holding on? There's got to be some errors in there somewhere that stop you from having faith in that, even as a concept. Now, I've presented a lot of proof to you that it is true. Proof about how the soul comes together, proof, but also physical proof is available to you in the world around you. Why are people attracted to each other? Why does every single person on this planet want to have one person at least that they live with? Why is it like that? Why is there under this underlying longing inside of the individual? It's because of this issue of soulmates. That's why it's there. You have it happening in your day-to-day -day life and yet there's got to be some error that stops you from having faith in it. Can you see that? Because if you actually had faith in it, five and a half years later, after five and a half years of experimenting, don't you think you would have probably found out more than you found out about it at this point in time? So what stopped us from experimenting? Fear stopped us from experimenting. Now I'm not suggesting being immoral or unethical. I'm just saying fear is the thing that stopped us from experimenting with this concept of soulmates. Now how many of us know for certain that you're with your soulmate? Know for certain. Okay, so a few. Know for certain. Now, can you see from that one illustration that five and a half years of presentation of facts to you has not turned that thing into a fact for you? Can you see that? It hasn't turned it into a fact for you. Five and a half years of presentation about that information. Now, we can't really laugh at somebody else now how slow they are, can we? If we look at that, we've got to say, OK, there's something going on there. After five and a half years of having this thing presented to me, that I actually do feel is quite a loving thing. I think I feel that at least. But there's got to be a lot of fear that prevents it from actually becoming a reality in my life if I'm experimenting with it. And why aren't I experimenting with it? Well, probably only because I'm afraid. That's the primary thing that's going on in my life. So it's the fear that dictates all of whether you're going to develop in these qualities. It's the fear that is controlling all of these things at the moment. In fact, you could say fear has become our God. And we literally worship it. On this planet, we worship our fear. It is a planet-wide problem with the human race. As soon as you do something different, everybody laughs at you, everybody ridicules you, everybody jumps on what you're doing. They are all afraid. Right? Now, we are all afraid, is what I'm saying. 
So how does this affect how we use our faith? Excuse well, me. at the moment... Sorry, Mary, you wanted to ask? Oh, sorry. It's my son's... Is it... Forward? We just have a light problem with our son. It's good. It's on me as well. We're just going to move around when the sun comes in the window because we're having exposure problems with our talks <laughs> when I get in the sunlight. Okay. Okay, so with our faith, we have faith in what our fear tells us. So let me just use an illustration with this. With the soulmate issue, what does your fear tell you? You, you tell me what your fear tells you. And I'll write some of the things down of what your fear tells you. Sonia, you want to start? About soulmates. It's impossible for me to have a soulmate. It's impossible for you to have one. Yeah, that's right, what okay. I feel. I feel like so it can't it's be. It's not true. Like I felt that, you know, like it's painful. So do you feel it's true for you or for others or just not for just you? Just for me. Okay, so you have I'm a personal one, feeling yeah. that everyone else has a soulmate. Yes. Except Sandra. Yeah. Wow, that's a pretty. Yep. So, uh, so we could say we could just say, look, it's not true. Or we have a personal feeling that it's not true. We don't have one. What else have we got, uh, Teresa? I might not like my soulmate. Sorry, you might. I might not like my soulmate. Okay, you won't like them. I. How many of you feel that you're not going to like them? Yeah, yeah quite a few of you. I won't, sorry, won't like them. Yep. What else do you feel? If we go to Graham and then come down here. Um, soulmates are all about love and I'm shit scared of love. Okay, so your soulmate frightens you, is that the idea? Love frightens me. Love frightens you. So, um, that's an interesting concept in itself. There's a big error. But, <laughs> but how does that relate to your soulmate? Tell me how that relates to your soulmate. Basically, you don't want, you don't want them. Is that how it is? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't okay. want them. I don't want, want them. Her, him, it should be, rather than them. It's because you haven't got more than one soulmate, of course. So I just remind you that when I say them, it's her or him. All right. Okay, so we come down My here. relationships haven't worked before. Why should it work now? Okay, yeah. I don't want to take a risk, and, another yeah, risk. And it'll be painful. Right, it's a painful risk. Okay. Anything else that we got there? Uh, my soul won't, won't like me. Yes, that's a good one. So uh, they won't like me. And remember, it's him, her. Like me. Yeah, okay. Um, if we come down to Jan and then across to Barb and then across to here. So if we come down to Barb first. If you have an attraction, it's the biggest. It's the biggest mistake that you can make if you pick the wrong person. Okay, so a, a risk of mistake. Making a mistake. You know, you might live with them even for a few years or whatever and then go, no, this person's not my soulmate, right? That'd be hard, eh? Um, fear of um, exposure, intimacy, everything being... So you know. can I just call it intimacy issues? Yeah. Intimacy issues. Inter issues. Right. So I'm afraid of being intimate issues. I have to learn how to spell properly issues. Yep. If we who's who hasn't had a go so far? If we corning, if we come to corning. I'm afraid of losing myself. Ah yes. So afraid of losing self. Uh, how do you spell lose? Lose. Self, or um, could we say c you want control? Afraid of losing control. Yeah, okay. If we go right up the back there, and 
who hasn't had a Joseph right up the back there. If you just leave your hand up. Does your soulmate have to be your partner? Okay. I, I, I'm deciding whether I want my soulmate to be my partner or not. I don't. When I say oh, does, nothing oh. has to happen, but the fear is, what if my soulmate's not my partner? Isn't that the fear? No, I'm just um, I'm asking the question whether you're referring to just um, a partner. I firmly believe my sister was my soulmate. Um, it's probably impossible for your sister to be your soulmate. Okay, that, that a... was my question. Can they? Can they be? <laughs> yeah, but uh, the the issue really is a is a question of um, who who is my soulmate from. A lot of times we feel our soulmate is a person who understands us, right? Or we understand them well. But what if our soulmate doesn't understand us at all? Well, that might be the feeling we have. So there's all sorts of questions that it, that it does relate to. And if you listen to the soulmate presentation, we talk about how, who the soulmate will have to be in, at one point or another. Yep. Joseph? I feel unworthy. So you feel unworthy? So you, they won't like you because you're not worthy? Is that the feeling? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, can we? Uh, we could probably go on for the next half an hour asking you reasons why not, right? Now, can you see that all of these things are your faith in the error? There's not much faith in the truth in there, is there? Like, let me talk to you about the truth that I've spoken to you about many times with your soulmate. Firstly, everyone has one. So there goes Sandra's error. <laughs> she believes she doesn't have one. Right? Everyone, every soulmate who is a soulmate of someone else is the perfect and ideal God-created partner for that particular person. So there goes the idea of whether they'll eventually like you or not or that you'll eventually like them or not. Right? The fear of love... Isn't that just a fear, a false belief? Like, surely love, is, if, if it's real love, would never be controlling, would never be overbearing, would never be manipulative, would never be any of these things that we're all afraid of. So, obviously, if we're afraid of love, we're not afraid of love. We're afraid of something that masquerades as love. Right? How can it be a painful risk when God created it to be? How can you make a mistake eventually if you're willing to experiment and discover yourself in the end? How can making a mistake be your main concern? Surely intimacy needs to be addressed and dealt with rather than just living in fear of it. If you're worried about losing yourself, then you've already lost yourself right now. <laughs> Do you understand that? If you're worried about losing yourself, then right now you've already lost yourself. That's why you're worried that if you be with somebody else, you'll lose yourself. And you also, if you're seeking control, then you're seeking... Like, haven't you learnt the truth? It's impossible to control anything. Haven't you learnt that truth in your life yet? There are so many things, right, that we could list here with all of these things that are all to do with false. And... It's our fear that stops us from releasing these particular beliefs from ourselves. So you have faith that these things are true. That's why the majority of you have not met your soulmate. Because you have faith that these things are true. And they're not true. But you have faith they're true. Right. Let's talk about the issue of God for a moment. How many of you feel that you have a day-to-day -day beautiful connection with God? Right. Just a few, maybe. And I can't agree with you, Elizabeth, actually. <laughs> you have a connection with a lot of spirits but you, that you think are God. Yep. Okay. Now, why don't we have a good connection with God? That's the question. So what do we really think about God? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. So what do you really think about God? Do you think God exists even? 
So maybe God, the error of belief maybe is that still inside is God does not exist. Doesn't exist. Any other beliefs that you feel inside of yourself about God? Yes. That um, God's going to treat me like my parents treated me. Right. So God. So Deb, you're sort of feeling like God's um, got ulterior motives all the time, and is going to try to harm you at some point. Really, that's really what you're feeling. So, so God is, and let's put it, manipulative, controlling. Da, 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 we could list a lot of things there. Yes, that a lot of us still believe about God. Controlling, punishing, punishing, etc. Yep. I personally am incapable of opening up to God. Is it just a personal feeling in terms of that you feel that you're permanently unable? Or do you feel that it's a temporary state? What, what is it that you're feeling? I hope that it's not permanent, but I feel like it... I think it's temporary. I hope it's temporary. So you sort of feel like you're, um, you don't have the capacity to have a relationship with God. There's something wrong with you. Is that how it feels? Yeah. So, so there's something wrong with me? Yeah. Yeah. And whatever that something wrong is... Could be that I'm not good enough. Something wrong with me. Could be that I'm not good enough, not worthy enough, not nice enough, not loving enough, not humble enough, and enough, enough, enough of all of those things. Yes? Yeah. Jen? For me, it's the issue of mistakes, that I've made too many mistakes that God would never want me back again. So, in other words, you're unforgivable. Yep. Yep, Rachel. Just uh, keep your hand up, so that's it. And Lorleen then here too. I have a kind of fear that... God can't be that good, can't no. be as good as I would hope. So, yeah, so God doesn't care, yeah. or even worse, that God's a nasty person. <laughs> God isn't that good. God is not that good. Yep. Okay. We come down to Teresa and then back to Liam. So, Teresa, please. God hasn't got enough time for me. So, yeah, it's He's almost too like... Busy. He's too, too busy. Too busy. <laughs> Looking after everyone else. <laughs> Liam? God is too busy? God's too big. God's too big? Too big for little old you to be any of his concern, yes? What if you respect other people's truths and the dilemma then becomes, which God? I didn't hear that clearly, sir. What if you respect other people's truths and they each believe in a different creator or God or, or version of God? Yeah. And then the dilemma is, which God? Okay, very good. So it's really about the definition of God. Like, what, who is God? What is God? You know, like in the, like this is what I've read. This I'll read you the first few paragraphs of my section about God. Societies, religions and individuals across the world have created a wide variety of theories about who or what God is. These theories include, but are not limited to, God is an entity, God is an energy force, God is the universe, God is nature, God is the quality of love, God is an alien life form, God is just a life form with more knowledge than humans. God is a creation of human imagination. We are all God. We are all fragments of God. Or God does not exist at all in any manner or form. Now, 
Isn't that how it is most of the time? Many believe that it's impossible to know any real answers about God anyway, so it is a waste of valuable time, effort and resources trying. Those who believe in God of some kind have also created a wide variety of theories about God's nature, character and attributes. These theories include, but are not limited to, God is love, God is punishing, God is angry, wrathful or even enraged, God does not care, God does care, God is a trinity of being, God is Jesus, God is narcissistic, God has a name, God holds grudges, God is forgiving, God is powerful, wise and loving and kind. Many of these assumptions, besides being contradictory, do not come from personal experience or reference to reality, but rather from using thoughts that people often call logic, but which I would argue often contain a complete lack of logic. The sad part of human history is that people are also willing to commit violent acts and even go to war for the sake of protecting such theories about God. Throughout the last 2,000 years, the religious justification of violence has been a major cause of pain and suffering on this planet. It has been my personal experience that the God we believe in is also the type of person we eventually become. We model our own behaviour on how God on how we believe God would behave. So this is a problem with our, problem, our issues with God. Now, again, can you see, we could keep going, yeah, couldn't we? We could keep writing off a whole heap of beliefs about God that are still within us. These beliefs are still within us. After five and a half years of hearing about, and maybe even longer for many of you, because you would have heard other people talk about it, that God is a God of love, we still believe these things. Now, how can we ever hope to have a changed life while we continue having faith in these errors? We can't, can we? You see, what happens, and what I've noticed happening for many of you, is that you continue to justify to yourself your errors. You continue to have faith in them. The problem with having faith in an error is that nothing in your life will ever change for the better. Because errors are all not facts. They are false. Right? And it's only our fear that causes us to retain such justifications. It's only our, our unwillingness to feel fear. And what's our unwillingness to feel any emotion? What's that called? A lack of humility. You see, if we had real faith, can you see it would help us even have humility? If we had real faith. If we had real faith that actually God's not like that. Right? That God's a different being than what we've been taught. If we fa had faith in that, then we would shift from our current perspective and we would at least even have some desire to feel our reasons why we believe God is like this. But until we work our way through those particular issues, we are not going to shift on our relationship with God. Uh, do you want to pray? Do you want to long for something fro from someone who doesn't exist? I don't know about you, but I wouldn't bother with that. Right? Do you want to long for love from somebody who is manipulative, controlling and punishing? According to the Bible, God's a genocidal maniac who murdered... They've done, some people have actually done some calculations and I think... The actual record of the numbers of people that God killed in the Bible add up to over 2 million. And that doesn't include the flood of Noah's day and it doesn't include the coming Armageddon that according to the Bible is coming. If you added the flood of Noah's day, which says that everybody died except for seven people, uh, and you had Armageddon, which says that everybody who's wicked on this planet currently will also die. Now we're up into the billions that God's going to kill, or God has killed. 
Now, you and I, nowadays, if some fellow who got into power did that, what would we call him? Well, what did you call Hitler or Stalin? And they've only killed 20, like Stalin, 20 million. Hitler, you know, at worst possible estimates, about 12 or 13 million directly responsible for. Um, and God's killed billions. Do you want to have a relationship with that God? I don't think I would want one if God turned out to be like that. This issue, there's something wrong with me. Right from the beginning, I've shared with you the real Lord's Prayer, the, thing, the prayer that I shared with the disciples in the first century. And I said to you, that the, and the very first part of the prayer reads like this. I'll, I'll read it to you, actually, because this is something that the majority of us still haven't accepted. We don't have faith in. Um, I'll just find where I've got the prayer. Got it in my, oh, here it is. My Father is in heaven. I recognize that you are all holy and loving and merciful and that I am your child and not the subservient, sinful and depraved creature that false teachers would have me believe. Very first line of the prayer. I recognize that you're all holy and loving and merciful. There goes unforgivable. <laughs> Right? There's something wrong with me because you've been like, oh, sorry, that the God's manipulative, controlling, and punishing. And then there's, and that I am not the subservient, sinful, and depraved creature. Well, there's, there's, there's something wrong with me gone. And there's God's not that good gone. And there's God's too busy gone. <laughs> like a lot of what's been listed there goes if we really had faith in that prayer. The fact is that the majority has no faith in that prayer. It's the very basis of your receiving love and you've got no faith in the prayer. Because you've got no faith in the God that you're praying to. Now, can you see again, it's our faith in our fear. Our fear has become such a God to us that we can't even have faith in something that's good anymore. Because we're so afraid. Lynn, you want to say? So if I'm afraid to feel the depth of how much my mother and father didn't love me um, and I think that I believe in God but know at the same time that what I have for my parents I transfer to God, how do I... You know, like what I, the thing, the question is, what was posed is, am I being real? No. If, that's right. And that's, that's the part I keep going, well, how do I become real? By, if, you become real by recognising that God is different to your parents. So stop attributing to God things that are only attributable to your parents. Now, many of you are justifying attributing them to God. You're basically saying to yourself, well, my parents were like that, so God must be like that. And then you say you have an intellectual belief that God is good, but the reality is if you have fear about processing the emotion, if you have fear and you're not allowing yourself to feel your fear, you don't trust that God is good. You don't trust that God's going to nurse you through that problem. You don't trust that God's going to care about you while you go through that emotion. You don't, you don't trust it. Because if you trusted it, you would have already gone through it. If you truly trusted God, if you truly had faith that God was good, you would, you would be willing to go through all of your emotions without any restriction, without any control. So, so if I'm saying to myself, I believe in God and I think he's loving and all of these things, it's not real, eh? If I haven't worked through to the point where I can feel my pain for my parents. Exactly. It's not going to be real. It can't be real. It can only be real after you've gone through that. And then that's when you'll start to feel something from God and therefore it becomes real. But, but also you're not coming to terms with the fact that these are things that you're attributing to God still because you've yet to release the emotion with your parents. So, so, so God's saying, 
please release your emotion with your parents. Please, we can have a, God's saying to you, we can have a better relationship as long as you release these emotions about your parents. And you're going, no, 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 I'm too frightened. I'm too frightened to release these emotions about my parents because you're not going to care for me while I do it. And God's saying, no, no, I'm not like your parent. I care for you while you're going to go through it. And then you go, but then everybody else will think I'm an idiot and a nutcase. And you know, I might even be put you know, in the mental asylum and going through these emotions. God's going, no, no, no. None of that can happen unless you tune out of your emotions. <laughs> right? None of that can happen unless you avoid them. It's only people, the only people who finish up in mental asylums are the people who avoided their emotions. The people who avoided going through experiences of grief and, other, and shame and other types of experiences end up there. Not the people who do it, who actually embrace those emotions. There's plenty of evidence of that being true. And yet we don't accept any of these evidences. And why don't we? Because we don't trust. And why don't we trust? Oh, but that gets back to my parents again. I don't trust because that's how they were. They were untrustworthy. But, but God's different and we don't believe it. We don't believe it. Because if we really believed it, we'd already be changing. Does that make sense to everyone? Mary, would you like to say? I was just on what Laleen was saying in your discussion with her. I sort of my experience that uh, I haven't finished dealing with all the pain of my life mm -hmm. but it is my experience that if I open up to God and take a step of faith this challenges the fears that have been governing that relationship mm -hmm. and it it triggers many of those emotions that I might have with my parents so one of my fears in reaching out to God is that God will engulf me and there'll be no me and I'll just have God's will imposed upon me because um, that's something I associate with love from my parents um, but if I have faith that, hang on, I know a lot of other things about God, even intellectually now, and I take a step of reaching out to God, I find that much of that grief and that fear is naturally processed and I begin to have an experience with God that is replacing the error with truth. Exactly. And I just see often, and I know I've fallen into this category, where people uh, get very hung up on well, I can't fully know God until I've healed all of the emotions with my parents. Kind of separating the two processes and feeling that they have to finish with the parents before they can start with God. Yeah, and, and all they've really got to do is separate the parents from God. Yes, and, and it's awesome when yeah. that happens. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And most of us have not separated our parents from God. Because if we had of, we would believe very different things about God than we believe about our parents right now. That makes sense, doesn't it? You would believe one set of things about God and another thing, set of things about your parents if you had separated those two. But if you still have them together inside of your own head, then how can you ever have faith that God's any different to your parents? You can't. All right? So this is where, again, faith in the truth is what's required rather than the fear. 